Managing Violence Podcast, Season 4, Episode 10, Survivor Shooting with Alan Baris. Hello ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are, I hope you're keeping safe in this crazy, crazy world that we're currently living in. It is my great pleasure to bring to you Season 4, Episode 10 today. It is the final episode of the season, but we're not going away too far. Uh, We're going to be taking one week off this time in between seasons, so uh, we'll be back before you know it. Uh, Just gives me a week to uh, do some more recording and to catch up on a few things that uh, that have been lacking. Um, life is crazy busy for me uh, and uh, doing my best to keep up with absolutely everything because I know some of you guys are really enjoying the podcast and I greatly appreciate it. Speaking of people that are really appreciating the podcast, I need to give a big shout out to our new Patreon members. So we have, uh, firstly, massive shout out to someone who's already had a shout out on the podcast, (laughs) Mr. Daryl Ryan, Daz Ryan. Uh, Daryl Ryan uh, uh, has been contributing. He's been a tribal elder uh, for a little while now. Uh, And uh, he uh, was on the $10 a month tier and he has voluntarily contributed up to $20 a month with with no extra perks uh, because he was grabbing such uh, value out of the podcast and wanted to support the podcast. And uh, uh, during this time of great financial pressure for so many people, uh, obviously, you know, some some people um, ha- have had to withdraw their, their their patronage, which I completely understand. Uh, we're all struggling. We're all going through different times. Some of us are still employed. Some of us are not. Uh, so obviously, if you're not in a position to contribute, then podcast should be at the bottom of your list uh, when it comes to priorities. But for those that are still in a position to contribute, like Daryl, uh, he has decided to up his contribution, which is hugely appreciated. So thank you very much, Daryl. I uh, can't express to you how much I appreciate that. Uh, We've also got two new tribal elder uh, contributors. One is Mark Segura. Mark Mark actually gets a shout out in this episode because he was the one that hooked me up with Alan Baris in the first place. And the second is Ilya Marashko. Uh, Ilya uh, has signed up to be a a tribal elder as well. Uh, So thank you very much for that contribution, Ilya. Greatly appreciated to all those who have signed up and continued their contributions. As I said, if you're in a position where you can't contribute, Totally fine. The show will always be free. It's always going to be free. Those of you that are in a position to contribute and say thank you, I say thank you to you. Uh, You make it possible. Uh, You help me cover my costs to make sure the show keeps going. So hugely appreciated. All right. um, We're going to move straight on into the episode today. So I'm joined by Alan Baris. Uh, Alan has been around the martial arts world for a long time. Uh, he first uh, first popped up onto my radar in the late '90s, uh, but he had uh, already written a book, or at least a, uh, at least one book, maybe a couple of books by that point. Uh, has been very active producing martial arts instructionals for the early part of his career, and in recent years, uh, dedicated himself to becoming an expert in active shooter defense and active shooter pr- preparation for regular people that uh, are not martial artists and don't have martial arts training. And uh, as you'll hear in our discussion, I mean the dealing with a shooting is a completely different to a martial arts scenario. It's a, it's a active security survival situation. And, uh, we, we go into great detail about his book, about his journey and, uh, about some of the key concepts that uh, will help you and prepare you and people that you are uh, responsible for or people you care about for surviving the worst case scenario of an active shooter event. So without further ado, here is Alan Baris. All right, Alan Burris, thank you so much for joining us on the Managing Violence podcast. It's great to hook up and uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't thank uh, Mark Segura for the uh, the uh, introduction and, and also the suggestion. So uh, thanks, Mark, wherever you are. And, and thanks, Alan, for joining us. Thank you, Joe. I'm you know glad to be here. And yeah, I want to thank Mark, too, for hooking us up. So. Yeah, really, and, and thank you also for sending me a copy of your, your excellent book, Survivor Shooting, which uh, we're going to be talking about uh, in detail. Uh, I'm also recording a uh, recording a video review of of the book as well, which will which will come out around the same time as this episode. But uh, what better way to, to start that than to than to talk to the author uh, himself? So, uh, mate, it's it's a very impressive book. But before we get into the book, uh, for those that don't know much about you, 
uh, obviously you, you're quite well known within the martial arts world, uh, but outside of that world, others may not know uh, a great deal about you. So would you mind telling a little bit about your story and uh, what led you to where you are now? Sure. I'll, you know, I'll try to get, I'll try to be brief, but, you know, cover sort of everything. And, you know, we can go back to the seventies when I was a kid and just had a fascination for martial arts and self-defense. And I didn't have a school to go to back then. So it was sort of like the karate kid learning out of books. And back then, you know, this Bruce Tigner and Fred Neff and some of those books in the eighties, I finally got a chance to do some formal martial art instruction, which was judo. Uh, in the town I was living at in Montana, Thompson Falls, we had a judo club. So I was able to get formal instruction and do some competing until the instructor moved away for work reasons. But then when I was in the military a few years later, after I graduated high school, you know, besides military training, which isn't martial art training, but I also studied at Wolf's Karate down on Yatkin Road when I was stationed at Fort Bragg. When I went to Korea with the military, I did a little bit of Taekwondo, but I was too busy with the Army. Um, you know, we were out in the field a lot. Then I went to sniper school. Then I went back as an assistant instructor at the 2nd Infantry Division Scout Sniper School. And that kept me out in the woods and busy for months at a time because the class would be a month long. So I didn't do that much formal martial art training while I was in the military um, in Korea, but I got into a lot of different fights, um, that and this and bar brawls, which gave me some practical experience. Came back to America, started training in Hapkido and back into judo um, with this Dennis Dallas. That was my first introduction to Hapkido and that was back in 89, 90. Then we fast forward a few years, and after I wrote my first book on self-defense for Paladin Press, I still wasn't a black belt. I had done all these different things, color belts here and there, but I'd always kept moving around a lot. So I went back to Korea to really study Hapkido. I was there as a civilian. This was in 96, 97, and I've been studying Hapkido and training Hapkido under the same instructor since. And so I'm currently a fifth Don, you know, not a grand master or anything, you know, outlandish, but I've been studying with that same instructor and I've received up to fifth Don through them in Korea. And I continue to go back and forth. And at the same time, I got my law degree. I wrote more books. I started doing videos with Paladin Press, started doing videos with Ike Productions, all on self-defense, martial arts security because I did a lot of security work throughout the 90s and even after law school I continued to do security part-time but then the Aurora shooting happened in 2012 you know at the Batman premiere and people started asking me about what to do in active shooter situations and that's when I really switched focus and started doing more in that area, the active shooter or active threat, because it's not always firearms um, response, especially for civilians. Mm. And the book that I sent you, Survive a Shooting, is the book that I wished would have been available when I was sort of shifting gears and wanting to do more into that topic. And I had quit practicing law and I was just writing, teaching, you know, I wrote a novel in there. I wrote some other things. I've always been writing, doing videos. But then I really started working on Survive a Shooting and focusing my training there. I became certified through Safari Land, and I was working with a team of Safari Land trainers. We taught thousands of people, mostly in schools, hospitals, nonprofits, you know, teaching civilians what they could do until law enforcement came. And that was the real focus of my book as well. And then I went out and started doing my own classes um, based on my book, where I wasn't doing just like Safari Land did. I, I was mod modifying things to meet the client's needs and to meet what people needed and wanted. Then I met Joe Anderson, who founded Reflex Protect. That was only not even two years ago. And he showed me Reflex Protect. And I said, hey, that's a missing piece. And then a little over a year ago, Christmas, Joe asked if I wanted to join with him. And so 
in January of 2019, I joined with Reflex Protect and we modified some of what I was doing with the active shooter response and we incorporated the Reflex Protect training. And I've been the director of um, active defense training for Reflex Protect now since January of 2019, continuing to teach what to do for civilians in an active shooter, active threat situation, and also teaching people how to implement the Reflex Protect defensive spray into that defense for any kind of workplace violence. And that sort of is a quick bringing it us to what I'm doing now. <laughs> that's, a, that's quite an efficient tour of a long career. <laughs> Skipped a lot of things, but you know, I tried to hit the highlights. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm quite impressed. Uh, normally when I ask that question, I guess we uh, sometimes get a, get a few stumbles and ums and ahs when we get to uh, yeah, try to summarize 30 or 40 years of, of uh, activity into, into a couple of minutes. But I think you, uh, I think you did a good job. Uh, so, so let's have a chat about the book. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the Aurora shooting. Uh, can you talk me through that process for you? I mean, obviously you're you're a martial artist. You've got a law degree. Uh, you're, you're teaching self defense, but that is quite different to be able to teach people how to survive a, a mass casualty event or or an active threat. So, can you talk to me about what your thought process was initially and how that evolved as you started uh, unpacking uh, responding to these kind of events. Sure. I mean, you know, self-defense and safety is what, you know, my main focus was, you know, and a lot of that is, is practical common sense, even though common sense is not commonly practiced, you know, in real life. But, you know, it's pretty easy to say, you know, a guy comes up with a gun, he demands your wallet, you give him the wallet, he goes away. You, you know, you don't have your money, but you have your life. You're not hurt. That's a win. You're going home to your family. With these active killers, all they want is a body count. So the way we respond to other kind of crimes, whether it's you know robbery, burglary, assault, different things, it's not the same because these people just want to kill people. And so the response has to be different. And at the time with the Aurora shooting, you know, I made a video standing out in front of the Batman movie poster at the local theater. And at the time, I didn't know much more about the topic than the federal run-hide fight, which on its front is, is good basic advice. And I provided that in that video, but I made a commitment to learn and do more. And that's when I started studying. That's when I became certified through Safariland and learning from them learning from the fellow Safari Land instructors that I was working with, many of them law enforcement officers. And I started to devise things and learn more, which eventually led to the book and to the courses I'm doing now. And I changed some of the terminology because I think, you know, and this goes to my studying of Anthony Robbins, you know, Tony Robbins for years, the words we use have meaning. And if we can change the words and the way we describe things, we can sometimes impact people better. And that's why I didn't like the run, hide, fight. And I changed some things. And I didn't like some of the way it was being taught. So I changed some things just to try to help more people. Uh, yeah. You know, and so that's sort of where I came from that and why I started changing things and developing things to help people. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I really enjoy that part of the book where you talk about the power of the words and, and uh, we'll, we'll get to your approach and the, the terminology you've used uh, as, as we get on. But uh, you, if, you, if you don't like run, hide, fight, you'd hate the Australian model, which is escape, hide, tell. So it's, That's similar to the UK. The UK uh, doesn't have a, a, they didn't have a fight version in theirs either. Yeah, it's a bit of a... Bit of a bugbear for me uh, because uh, initially they've only they've only just re-released it, and uh, initially if you unpack the escape hide tell, each section had the uh, had the, a fight component. You know, you may have to fight to escape, you may have to fight to hide, you may have to fight to you know communicate. Uh, but um, they've now removed that as well, so, <laughs> so it's, right. it's even less it's even less offensive uh, than what it was before, and. Uh, yeah. Anyway, we, <laughs> I, won't, I won't. I won't get on my soapbox because this episode's about you. But uh, you know, I, I agree. And the people that make these models, I think they're doing them to try to help. But some of the people making these models, 
they're not as experienced in violence and what's actually going on and how people's brains work. And so what might be good in a model on paper, they're forgetting the reality of, of how people react and of how violence unfolds. Yeah. Uh, let's, let's jump, jump into the book. Um, one of the things that I really enjoyed about your book is that it's, it's incredibly thorough. Uh, it's, it's not a quick, it's, it's not a, it's not a 50 page manual of a how to, this is a, it's a real study into active shooters, active killers. And, uh, and really the thing I liked it to start off with is the history. And it's something that's, uh, I think overlooked in that, uh, we, we often look at active, active killing events as being a modern phenomena. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about your research and what you uncovered as you started, uh, you know, looking into the history of, of active killing events? Well, they're not new. And I like to point that out in the book and in my classes, just to show that people have been killing people for a long time. And so it's not necessarily a new phenomenon. And, you know, there were mass killings in schools way before the modern school killings because the same reason as today. They were easy targets. However, you can't deny that they're increasing in frequency. But, you know, one of the oldest ones I talk about happened in 1764 again, quite a few years ago, and this is in the United States, and it happened for the same reason. The school was, you know, the headmaster Brown, and the, uh, I think there was nine children that were killed, seven or nine children that were killed with him. They were easy targets. So it's the same reason that they're being killed today, is the easy targets. And i just like to point that out, because while it is increasing, it's not new. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, it, it's an interesting uh, historical tour that you provide at the start of the book just to uh, cover off on some of the some of the major events. And it, it does set the context that this isn't uh, this isn't a modern problem. And, and it's, it's not even just a US problem. Uh, and I think uh, yeah, I teach a little bit of active shooter or active uh, active armed defender is the terminology we use here. Uh, but uh, I teach a little bit of that here. But it, people are, uh, are fairly naive because we have gun control. Uh, firearms are not as readily accessible. Uh, we haven't had the number of shootings and people kind of put their head in the sand about uh, active killers, but it's uh, yeah, just because there's not a firearm involved or just because it's not a legally uh, accessible firearm doesn't mean that it's not a problem. And uh, we, we certainly have had enough incidents, I think, to, uh, to warrant preparing for it. We have. I mean, and it's not to get paranoid, but it's, it's a fact of life that there are people that prey on other people and there are people that will want to prey on large groups of people to get a large body count and being prepared having a plan a little forethought can make the difference in these events i you know i always bring up in my live classes the pulse nightclub shooting that happened down there in florida you know he killed what 49 people there is no doubt in my mind that if those people in that nightclub had gone to one of my classes or one of the safari land classes or read my book or did the some of the other classes there's, there's other great classes out there helping people if they would have been students of one of those classes and had a plan there's no way one person would be able to go in and kill 49 of them like he did it, it's just it blows my mind that, you know, those people, they, they didn't have a plan. They didn't know what to do. And they just, they died in fear rather than being proactive that could have saved lives. And that's all I want people to do is have that plan that if something terrible happens, we can reduce the number of people injured and killed. Absolutely. And look, if you do one of these courses or you read this book and you never have to use the skills, then that's great. Uh, but if you, if you ever have to use them, that will probably be the best purchase you've ever made. And, uh, and realistically, even, uh, even if you're never involved in a, um, you know, a most horrific active killing event, just having some of these skills will enable you to, uh, to better prepare for, uh, for any kind of emergency, like just be able to evacuate, be able to lock down, whatever it is, um, those skills are, uh, transfer. They do. And, you know, my motto is, you know, enjoy life safely. 
I don't want people paranoid hiding at home because they think the world is a scary place. I want them to have some common sense safety strategies and a plan of what to do in an emergency so they can go about life enjoying things. I mean, there's, you know, there's a picture in the book close to the back of my family and I at the Winter Olympics in South Korea. You know, and at that time, people were worried about this and that and saying, well, that could be dangerous. No, my family and I went and enjoyed the Olympics. But did I know where exits were? Of course. Was I paying attention to what's going on around me? Of course. And we're going to do things safely, but we're also going to enjoy life. And that's what I want for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I think that's, that's, that needs to be the goal of, of any sort of training that we do in this space. It, it, has to, it has to improve your quality of life, not make you more paranoid and more scared. Um, I mean, if your training is making you more scared, I think you're probably approaching it the wrong way or, or you're studying the wrong things. Absolutely. Uh, I just uh, just want to pick out a couple of concepts in the book that I think uh, would be useful for people that that haven't read it. Um, uh, now, obviously, this this is a an hour long interview. It doesn't replace reading the uh, three hundred plus page book. So, I h- highly recommend you go out and buy this book if you enjoy the conversation. But uh, can you just talk us through the OODA loop? I mean, the, it, it is a concept that's been uh, in the martial arts or in the combatives world for a long time. Uh, but I really like the way you explain it in the book and, uh, and the practical applications of the OODA loop for active shooter uh, events. Sure. I mean, OODA, for those that aren't familiar with the concept, you know, it was created by an Air Force uh, Colonel Boyd, Air Force pilot. And it's basically, it's a framework to look at how we process information. So we first, we have to observe something, then we orient to it, then we have to decide what to do, and then we act on that decision. So that's OODA. And the quicker we can get through that cycle and get to acting, the better we're going to be in an emergency situation. So I see the guy come through the door, I observe him, I orient that you know, he has a gun and he shouldn't be having a gun in in this situation. I need to decide what to do. I'm going to either escape danger, I'm going to deny him access to me, or I'm going to attack back and defend myself and take him out, depending on the proximity to the threat and the location that we're at. And after I've made that decision, I'm going to act and do it. Um, What slows people down is under high stress, It's hard to think and decide what you're going to do. That's why I want you to have a model already. And I want you to know those responses and have that plan so you're not trying to figure it out under stress, which is extremely hard to do. Also, people will deny what they're actually observing and orienting on. You know, we we hear the sound, but we're going to deny that it's gunfire. We're going to think it's a car backfiring or a door slamming or something because we don't want to think about the terrible thing that it could be, which is gunfire and people dying. And that denial can slow down the loop and prevent us to getting to action quick enough. So we can do things to increase the speed that we get through that loop and get to action, which can save lives. We can also do things that will prevent him from getting to action as fast because the killer is going through a loop as well. And he's already decided what he wants to do. He wants to kill people. He just has to observe and orient on the targets and pull a trigger or stab or slash whatever weapon he has. So his OODA loop is already a little bit shortened because he's made the decision. But if we can screw that OODA loop up by uh, just, you know, hitting him in the head with something or spraying him in the face with a fire extinguisher or a defensive spray or anything that could prevents him from observing, orienting on a target and pulling the trigger, we're also saving lives. So the key is speed our loop up, slow his down, and the combination of those can reduce the number of people in these situations being harmed or killed. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed that uh, you went into detail about how to actually um, interfere with the killer's OODA loop as well. Uh, we, we always talk about, or I think a lot of people talk about how to, um, uh, how to maximize your, your own process, but uh, to slow down his process or interrupt his process is, uh, is incredibly valuable. And I, I enjoyed that part of the book. 
Uh, moving on to your model, uh, the escape, deny, attack back model. Um, can you just talk through the, the evolution of that and, uh, and the power of those words? Sure. I mean, I took the basic framework of run, hide, fight. And I have been, I've had people say, well, your model isn't any different. And that is correct. And if you want to look at it that way, but I change the words because I think they're more powerful. I like escape better than run because you might be dropping to the ground and crawling. It might be going out a window. I don't want people just to run. And I've actually seen people in exercises run toward the killer. You know, and this is with shooting blanks inside a building. So these are scenarios. But people running toward the person that was shooting the blanks because they didn't know where the gunfire in the building was coming from. And so I really want to make sure that people are escaping the danger zone. And so if, if that includes running or going out a window or crawling, whatever, it needs to be getting you out of danger. And that's like why I like the word escape. I like the word deny because it's a little more proactive than hide. I don't like the word hide because hiding and hoping is not necessarily a plan for survival. I'd rather be doing something proactive. Now, hiding, getting yourself behind cover or concealment, cover being something that stops bullets, concealment being something that only hides you but bullets can go through, either of them can be a way of denying the killer access to kill you. Because if he does not see you or hear you, he may not shoot. Getting behind cover, denying him access to be able to shoot through that and kill you is better, but hiding behind concealment is also a strategy. But I'd rather be a little more proactive and be barricading, locking doors, finding cover, doing everything I can to deny him the ability to kill me. And I say him because these killers have been predominantly male, even though there have been a few females out there. Then when we get to attack back, I like that better than fight um, because I want you to take him out. If it comes to it where you are fighting for your life, it, you need to stop that threat and you do whatever it takes. It's not just defending. You can't just block bullets. You're not, you know, like, you know, if you're defensive, if you're a martial art and you learn these blocks to defend yourself, well, they don't work against bullets. You need to do something to physically stop that person. And so I'm going to attack back. I use back because most people don't attack others. Good people don't go around attacking others. We're attacking back. I'm giving you permission to do it because he started it. He's trying to kill you or others. We're going to stop that threat. And that's why I use those terminologies when I'm in the book and when I'm teaching. Yeah, I, I think that's really powerful. Uh, and as you said, the, the power of the words, um, they, they mean something. And uh, especially for those that may not have ever put themselves in that survivor's mindset or that, that warrior's mindset. Uh, that those words can make a big difference. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the, um, why you've, you've set it up as a, as a triangle as opposed to a linear model? So it's prob probably, hard to, uh, probably hard to explain in, uh, in audio, but uh, the, in, in the book, the escape, deny, and attack back is set up as a triangle as opposed to a, a, a sequence. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that theory? Sure. And that's a lot of times when you would hear people teaching the run, hide, fight, you would hear, first you run. If you can't run, then you hide. If you can't hide, only as a last resort, you should fight. And then they tell people to use whatever kind of improvised weapons to fight back with. That was how that model is usually taught. But doing the different drills and the scenarios and different things, it didn't always work out that way. If you or I are sitting in, let's say, a classroom, and we're in the front row because we're good students, and a killer bursts through that door, and he's right there in front of us, there is nowhere to run. There is nowhere to hide. Our proximity to that killer means the only thing we have available is for you and I to tackle him. Maybe one of us gets hurt, maybe both, but it's going to give us the best chance for everybody else in the room to survive. So 
it's not a linear process. It, a triangle and I either put move or act depending on which triangle I, I teach with in the middle you have to do something but what you do is going to depend on where you're at if you're in the very back of that room that classroom because you're you know you're not a good student you like to do whatever in the back corner and there's an open window there and the guy comes busting through your best option is jump out that window and escape and run away you can't fight from back there so that's what you do. You escape. Okay. If you're at the other corner and there's no, there's a closet or say there's a big safe, you know, a safe room or whatever, and you can jump in and close that door and it's bulletproof and keep you, well, you've just denied that killer access. So if we're all in that same imaginary classroom, our responses are different depending on where we're at. And that's why I teach it as a triangle rather than a linear because in our imaginary classroom, each of those people only had one of the prongs available to them. They didn't, ha and I don't want you cycling through, well, that guy in the back saying, well, I have to run. No, you just got to lock that door. The guy in the back, yeah, he can escape. Us up front, that's all we can do is um, do what we can to, uh, to fight back. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's key when it comes to also trying to prepare. So, uh, uh, let's say a congregation or a, a house of worship is if you're if you're training a group of people, then then they need to know that different people are going to have different roles. Uh, whoever's closest to the threat is probably going to have to engage the threat, and whoever whoever is further away from the threat is probably going to have to start either locking down or coordinating an evacuation. Uh, so. I think be able to differentiate between you know, not everyone is going to run, not everyone is going to evacuate, not everyone is going to fight. It really depends on the proximity to the threat and what's available to you and, and what, what those options are. It's, as you said, it's not a linear process. It's not, you know, and probably the most important for schools, you know, cause that's, you know, we do do a lot. I do a lot of training in schools is the lockdown process. There's only going to be a small portion of the students or teachers and staff that are in close proximity to the killer. Everyone else in that school is probably gonna be able to lock down if they have an effective lockdown procedure and the correct lockdown mechanisms, they can keep students safe. Um, other businesses that would account for too. So it's, you, know, you wouldn't necessarily want all these kindergarten kids running. No, they're gonna lock down. That's gonna be the most effective for them except for that small handful that are in the proximity of the killer and they're going to be fighting or attacking back and stopping the killer is their best thing. So it really does just depend. Um, the proximity and your strengths and weaknesses as well. Um, I always teach people, if you're not a fighter, you better get really good at denying access and escaping. You know, if, if you can't escape for whatever reason, you better be very good at having a good deny or lockdown process and a way to defend yourself and attack back. Uh, so if you're hampered with one of those three, be better at the other two. It's really good advice. Let's unpack uh, escaping. Um, now we'll, we'll go through escape, deny and attack back in sequence. Um, obviously, as we just said, it's not a sequence, but you know, for the sake of having a structure to work with in the conversation, uh, let's talk about escaping and, and, uh, the importance of movement and getting off the X. Uh, can you sort of talk through the, the main principles of escape? And, and basically you just said it, get off the X, get out of the kill zone. If you are in the kill zone, you're in danger. So anything you can do, whether that's running, whether it's going out a window, whether it's diving down and crawling away, whatever you can do to get out of the area where that killer can shoot you, is a survival strategy. And I want you just to get out as fast as possible. If you're running, don't worry about zigzagging, just as fast as you can, get out of there. Um, one of the, the worst scenarios in America was the Las Vegas shooting, where he was up in the hotel room shooting down at that concert. Yeah, you couldn't- Pretty horrible scenario. <laughs> yeah, you couldn't attack back there. That, so you, that one part of the triangle was gone. Even if you had a, you know, if you were carrying a concealed weapon or something, you're not going to be able to shoot that hotel window and without a rifle and such. So one, one point of the triangle is gone. 
So your best avenue there was escaping, and that's running as fast as you can out of the kill zone. The only way you could deny him access there is if you could find some cover that you could have gotten behind that he couldn't shoot through. So escaping is just that. Get out of the area where you can be killed. I think that that Las Vegas one was um, a good example of the OODA loop because the, I imagine the hysteria and the panic and even just trying to figure out like where what is happening, where are the gunshots coming from? I mean, trying to trying to figure out even cover uh, in that scenario, without knowing where the where the, the gunshots are even coming from, would be incredibly difficult. And then you've got the uh, the panic and the stampede of people all trying to move or trying to run. Uh, just a horrific situation to try and navigate. I agree, and you know, I know a couple people that were there. Um, one of them had actually gone through the Safari Land based training and said that that training did help. And she actually felt a little bit guilty about escaping and leaving people behind. But then she did, because she's in the medical field, she did go back when the shooting had stopped and started applying her medical skills uh, to help save people. You know, and I told her when we're talking, I said, you have nothing to be embarrassed about. You did what you needed to do to keep yourself and your family alive so you could then go back and help people when you were able to. And so that's a successful outcome by anybody's means. And she has nothing to feel guilty about whatsoever. Well, that's right. I mean, you're no good to anyone if you're, uh, if you're bleeding on the ground and, uh, and needing help yourself. It's, uh, it's, we've got to preserve our own lives first before we can help anybody else. So, uh, it, but I think that's classic survivor guilt. Uh, we come across that a lot. Um, that those of us that are trained that survive sometimes it's like, well, maybe I could have done more. Maybe I could have helped other people. But uh, at the end of the day, if you keep yourself safe and you can go back and, and render some assistance and that's, that's certainly better than the alternative. Exactly. And I tell people when they ask some of these hard questions is I don't know um, what you should or shouldn't do in some of these situations. I can tell you this, I will behave differently if I'm alone, if I'm with my family, if I'm in a job where I'm getting paid to help others. And bottom line, you have to be able to sleep with yourself when you go home. I, and so I can't answer everything to the minute detail. You have to be able to sleep when you go home and your actions may be different depending on your own personal strengths and weaknesses and who you're with. Absolutely. That's, and that's a really interesting point because uh, I've often thought myself, you know, that I think any of us that are in this kind of field, you, you mentally role play different situations and you create blueprints in your mind of what you'd do if this situation happened. And, uh, but it changes. I mean, if, if I'm on my own uh, or even if I'm with my, my wife and kids and I know my wife could take the kids out, that enables me to have other options. If I'm with my young children on my own, then the only option for me is to get them out. I'm not leaving them to the, to the mercy of the crowd while I go and engage a threat. Uh, and it just changes. I mean, that's reality. We we have to layer those uh, those different elements of a scenario so that we're, we we don't condition ourselves to one particular response that may not be the best response in the situation. Exactly, and they're going to change as your kids get older, or if something happens to your wife. You know, if she has her leg broken and she's in a cast and she's not a hundred percent, or you're not a hundred percent because you got your leg broken in a cast. Or, I mean, there's all these variables that change throughout our life, which affect our plans and what we would do if we re respond. And we have to take those into account. Absolutely. Uh, actually, I was just watching a video uh, by Richard Dimitri and, uh, he made a really good point. This is sort of a little bit, a little bit separate from active shooter for the second. Uh, but uh, just tying in the human elements of, of self-defense about, uh, you know, the, we, if we focus on a, a physical threat or a technique based threat, we miss so many of the, the behavioral and emotional elements. For example, uh, in the video, he talks about uh, if uh, you, you've got someone who's, yeah, strangling. You got you got a, a teenager, a teenager watching a man strangling his mother. It's very easy to say, well, you pick up something, you bash him over the head. But what if that person who's strangling his mother is his father, uh, who he loves, and he doesn't want to bash dad's head in because this is a uh, you know, unu an unusual event. It's not a, not a systemic abuse. 
uh, yeah, that's a completely different scenario. That kid can't just pick up a fire extinguisher and hit dad over the head with it because he loves dad. He doesn't want to kill dad. So in, you, you start throwing in those layers of relationship and, uh, and, and circumstance and it changes everything. Uh, and I think it's important for us in every area that where we're teaching um, you know, self-preservation that we, uh, we don't neglect that. The, the, the layers of, of uh, the layers of the young and continue to go deeper. And we need to, we need to blueprint for all sorts of scenarios. That's so true. And, you know, I'll, real quickly, I'll say that's one of the reasons I advocate the reflex protect defensive spray in schools rather than firearms. I mean, there are many reasons, but one of them, Many school shooters, the majority of them, are students who already have a relationship with that teacher. So you're asking a teacher to use lethal force against somebody that they've been caring for and a student. Much more difficult than asking a teacher to use a non-lethal tool to stop that student. Um, and so there's a lot of psychological things in there when we're teaching this stuff that um, go into the non-lethal versus lethal options especially when people have a relationship with the person you're asking to use that tool against. Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent point. Uh, I, I think it's a, it's a very hard ask to, to um, get someone to pull a trigger literally uh, on, on somebody that uh, they care about, or at least they have, they have a level of empathy for uh, in, in the situation. Uh, let's move on to deny. So uh, you talked a little bit about it in um, you know, as we're, as we're talking through the triangle, but uh, what are the main strategies that, that you teach for denying? Lockdown is one of the biggest. And then I, obviously if you have a system where you you know, good doors, good locking systems, and some of the best are electronic. So admin and law enforcement can bypass them later when need be. But there's also, I teach a variety of ways to improvise lockdowns. Could be barricading. It, you know, I like to take a couple, um, usually the smallest ladies in a group, and show how they can make a chain from the door to an immovable object, such as a wall, and then have the biggest guys in the class not be able to open the door. And it usually involves either sitting or laying on the ground and forming a chain depending on how far the wall is away will depend on how many ladies I have in the chain. Sometimes it's one, two, or more. And just to show, get people thinking that there are ways that you can keep somebody out, even if doors don't lock. Uh, so that's one way you can use uh, cover, making sure people understand what is bulletproof and what's not bulletproof and understand the concept and ask them in their awareness, which I also emphasize being more aware that they recognize what is cover and what is not cover so they can have something to get behind that could protect them. Uh, and then just preparing their locations that they're most frequently in to better be able to deny somebody. And that's, you know, we call hardening the target. It may be putting better doors and locks. It may be putting a ballistic glass or laminate on windows. It may be different kind of architecture when we're building new schools or hospitals or buildings. So, but we can harden the target to make it easier to deny access to certain people. Yeah, that, that prevention and uh, yeah, thinking ahead is, is so important. Um, I always tell people you can't think creatively in the moment. Right? The, cre the time for creativity and, and design is, is before the event, not, not during the event. Uh, during the event is purely you know, reactive, really. Uh, so it's, it's so important we think about this beforehand. That, that is so true. I mean, when I go into disaster mindset and psychology and the effects of fear, you know, one of the things is we do not think as well under the high stress and fear. It's, it's hard to do that, make the plan then. And that's why I want you to have them beforehand. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's, let's just to complete the triangle. Let's talk about a, a, attacking back. Um, I think probably the one of the challenges with attacking back for regular people is the mindset uh, that, that you're actually going to do harm to somebody. How do you get through for, for people that are otherwise, you know, quote unquote, normal people <laughs> that, that have never been in a fight, that have never imagined doing harm to somebody? How do you break through that to, to enable them to, uh, I guess, release that, uh, that inner savage, for lack of a better term? 
you know, there's a couple things I do in all of my live classes. One is the fluffy story, which I have modified from, you know, Mark McYoung, a friend of mine for, you know, longer than we either of us care to admit, because that means we're getting old. But, <laughs> um, but, you know, I talk about fluffy as far as, you know, I ask people, you know, who's a, fr how, how big is an average cat? And I get anywhere from 10 to 20 pounds. I had a lady have it. She, she said 25 pounds one time. I'm like, that's a big cat. <laughs> but, but we all then agree, the whole group agree that we are all much larger than even your average house cat. And then I ask who wants to give Fluffy a bath. You know, that cat is going to, you know, holler, scream, scratch, bite, go under, over, through you to get away. That's the kind of attitude that you have to have. That You have to be willing. And I want them to visualize being willing to, to bite, scratch, stomp, hammer fist, rip eyes out, hit them in the throat, you know, anything it takes to be a survivor when you're trying to survive for your life. And I don't care if people are stabbed or shot or hurt, you still have to keep going. And I ask people, I say, you know, how many times can you get shot and keep fighting? And I always get the, well, depends on how many, where you get shot and blah, blah, blah. And I said, I know, but give me some numbers and I'll hear a two or a three or a five or a six. And then I'll tell them, well, those are all good numbers, but I'm going to say 27. And people like, you know, look at me sort of funny. And I say 27 because Mike Day was shot. He was a Navy SEAL. He was shot 27 times. 11 in the body armor, the rest outside, 16 outside the body armor, and he survived. You can look him up on YouTube, you know, type Mike Day, Navy SEAL 27, you'll find interviews with him. And in some of those interviews, he talks about a couple things that kept him going. One is his family, the other is his faith. And I tell everybody that before they leave my classes, and I want anybody listening right now to figure it out, what are you going to survive for? It can be your family. It can be your faith. And I hope at least part of it's you because you're not done yet. You got things to do. But you have to figure it out what you're going to be a survivor for. And then you have to mentally prepare yourself to hurt and or kill a person that's trying to hurt or kill you if that's the only way to stop them. And, and you got to get your mind around that. Some people, it's going to be easier than others. Um, sometimes I got to go with people. It's like, do you have kids? Do you have little kids? Think about somebody going to hurt those little kids. Get that mindset of what you're going to do to protect those kids. Because some people will protect their little kids before they'll protect themselves. But we got to get around that mindset. And, and I've had people say, you know, I never thought of that before, but I think I could do it now you know, after some of these classes. But those are a couple strategies to get people around those concepts. Yeah, uh, I think that's, that's really powerful. And uh, I also use the, the uh, connecting with the children and, you know, uh, for, for uh, especially I find that, um, uh, not, not to typecast, but just from experience, uh, I find that women uh, tend to have a, a little bit more resistance to defending themselves but if you start putting their kids involved, then uh, <laughs> there's, no, there's no resistance to defending the children. Um, so I often ask them the question, well, what do you think your kid's quality of life looks like if mum dies today? You know, like if, if they grew up without a mum, uh, how does that impact their quality of life? Now look at that attacker or that person and, and say, you're trying to take away my children's mother, uh, even, if, even if there's no threat to your children uh, directly. The fact that uh, they're trying to impact your child's quality of life ongoing uh, is sometimes enough. Exactly. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about improvised weapons. Uh, so obviously, I mean, if you're in, in an environment where you have concealed carry or you have uh, armed defenders that are, that are available, then that's great. Um, if you don't have that available to you, what sort of improvised weapons do you train people to use? And, and how important is actually training with improvised weapons as opposed to just assuming you'll know what to do with it if you have to? And most of the people that I teach are in schools, uh, colleges, you know, university settings, hospitals, other businesses where they are not allowed to carry firearms, either because of institution policy or 
you know, actual laws that forbid the carrying of firearms in some of these places. So when we get down to how they're going to attack back and defend themselves, improvised weapons are very important or less than lethal weapons. Um, I really think improvised weapons is more of a mindset than an object. If you have the right mindset, you can turn anything into a weapon. You know, I, 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 you know, I teach a hammer fist and then I show people how you can use a pen or, you know, a pencil in your hand and turn it into something. And I always joke and say, you know, how many people did John Wick kill with a pencil? What's the legend? And if you remember the movie, <laughs> the, the old Russian, do you know the answer to yeah. that one? The old Russian yeah. guy? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's crazy. He killed, three, he killed three people with a pencil, you know, the legend of John Wick. <laughs> so it's, it's a mindset more than an object. But some of the things that I do prefer, when you teach somebody a hammer fist, anything that you can put in your hand, whether it's a pen, a pencil, a key, a screwdriver, anything sticking out the bottom at hand, hammer fist can be a good improvised weapon. I like teaching fire extinguishers because they're everywhere. All schools and public buildings, they have to have fire extinguishers. So knowing how to use a fire extinguisher as a weapon can be beneficial. And then I also teach the non-lethal. One of the reasons I joined Reflex Protect is because with the philosophy of why improvise if you can have a tool made for the job. And so it's a non-lethal that schools, hospitals, and other places are allowing teachers and nurses and stuff to have access to. So that's why I teach that as well. I still teach other things in case they don't have Reflex Protect, but why improvise if you could have a tool? And that's why I joined the company and teach both. Yeah, let's, let's explore Reflex Protect. I mean, you, you've referenced it quite, quite a bit. So what, what is it that is that, what's the unique selling point for Reflex Protect over, say, any other type of spray? It doesn't contaminate the entire room like pepper spray and some of the others. I could put my arm around your shoulders. We could be standing there, my arm around your shoulders. I could have a person spray you and I would be fine and everybody else in the room would be fine. You know, I mean, it's not a magic wand. You do have to spray the person in the face and get it in their eyes and mucous membranes for it to be effective. But it is extremely effective when you do spray it in the face and get it in the eyes, and it doesn't contaminate everything. And we also have a decontaminant that can clean up any surfaces or the person after they've been sprayed. You know, it was actually created for hospitals because they have such a high... Um, amount of workplace violence with nurses and other people getting beat up and the actual uses have been in hospitals not against shooters but against people that have been trying to beat up nurses and yep. it has stopped them and kept people safe and then they can help that person once it's over too so it's you know there's no hesitancy of spraying somebody because they can help them and clean up right afterwards and you don't shut the buildings down like with pepper spray um, it's a game changer and it's, you know, it's brand new and that's why I joined the company. I mean, I honestly believe it's one of the best non-lethals available for many circumstances and why I joined the company and was such a supporter of it. Yeah, it's certainly very interesting. Um, having, uh, having had the great <laughs> fortune of being sprayed by uh, the residue, <laughs> try, <laughs> try to try to save a police officer from a, from a situation that was rapidly out of control and uh, and wearing a face full of foam for my my troubles, uh, I kind of wish they'd had that at the time. <laughs> uh, let's move on to the to after the event. I mean, we're we're coming up on time, but I think we'd be remiss not to talk about after the event. Um, firstly, being able to control or control the stop the bleeding, control the situation, and and be able to render assistance while emergency services uh, are responding. Uh, one of the things that um, I find that most people don't realize is that your your EMTs or your your paramedics or your, your ambulance, whatever it is where you are, they're not going to be coming straight onto scene uh, until the police give them the all clear that it's safe. So there's going to be a, a prolonged period of time where you may have casualties that are literally bleeding to death uh, and no one's going to be tending to them uh, unless you are. So let's talk a little bit about the importance of of everyone having the skills to be able to help in that situation. Yes, I think it's extremely important that everybody learn to how to use a tourniquet, a pressure bandage, and have them accessible. Uh, you know, I ask people in all my classes, who has a tourniquet in their car? 
and I get very few hands being raised. And I'm like, why not? I mean, you're actually, you're way more apt to get into an automobile accident than an active killing situation. And tourniquets will save lives in that automobile accident as well. And most likely, the life you save will be yourself or someone you care about. So I want everybody to have some really basic trauma aid. Stopping hemorrhaging, stopping the bleeding is so critical in certain situations. Active shooter, active killer situations, but also automobiles and other things. And having the knowledge and tools available. Because yes, you can improvise a tourniquet. And there are some things better than others to improvise with. Some of the stuff you read online is not the best way to go about it. But why not spend a few dollars? You can get a, a real tourniquet, a legitimate, high quality, good tourniquet for in the $30 range. Why not spend that money, have one available, and be prepared to save a life if you ever have to? Yeah. Uh completely echo that <laughs> there's, there's to me is it is the same as having a fire extinguisher if, if you have a fire extinguisher why not have a tourniquet you, you never know you never know i mean I, i've i've never had to use a fire extinguisher in my home but i've got one so <laughs> why not i'm the same way and i have one you know i have a tourniquet in my car i don't you know when i travel i got a little kit with all this different stuff and i have tourniquets in there I, that's just part of the kit just in case. I hope I never have to use them, but if I do, good odds it'll be me, my wife, or daughter that I'm using it on. Um, and so I want to be prepared in case they're ever hurt or I'm ever hurt. And yeah, if I have to help a stranger, that's good too. Yeah. Yeah. I, actually, one of the uh, forehead slapping moments of my life was realizing how much more prepared I was to help strangers at work than I was uh, to actually help my own family. <laughs> it wasn't until I started looking at going camping with my kids and we've been going to more remote areas that I thought, oh, I really need to actually stock up and be a little bit more prepared. And, and then I realized that how much time I'd spent preparing to help others without even thinking about my own family, which is, uh, yeah, well, you, you feel a little bit negligent, but I'm glad I had that realization before I needed to. Exactly. Yeah. Um, this, the, the other component, I think, of the, the post-incident is, uh, is dealing with authorities once they arrive. Uh, and, I, and I think that's really important because everyone's going to be in a heightened state of, a, of emotion and adrenaline. And uh, it's very easy to do the wrong things. Uh, and uh, you know, law enforcement are going to be looking for a threat. Uh, so uh, let's talk through some of those principles uh, before we wrap up. Certainly. I mean, because that's extremely important. And, you know, I'm not anti-firearm, even though I teach groups that are not allowed to carry a far firearm. You know, in America, a lot of people do. And it is a fact that people with concealed firearms have stopped these incidents. It's BS when you say that the only way to stop them is with another firearm, because many people without firearms have also stopped these incidents with improvised weapons and other different things. But regardless, if you have a firearm or you stop the killer and you take that person's weapon, you don't want to be running around with it in your hand and become an innocent victim when law enforcement shows up. So you need to be able to either put that weapon away or often what I teach people in a class, if they've taken the, the bad guy's weapon and maybe they're restraining the bad guy on the ground. I have them set that weapon on a table or someplace where if the, the buddy that's holding the bad guy, if the bad guy gets loose and becomes a threat again, they could pick up that weapon and defend themselves and others if they had to. But if the police come in, they can show their hands back up and say, bad guy is there, his weapon is on that table, and let the police see that they are not a threat is the most important thing you can do is show law enforcement your hands that you are not a threat. So I don't want you holding your gun or the bad guy's gun when the police show up. And then I want you just to follow directions of law enforcement, help them whatever in, you know, intelligence you can give and follow directions and not be offended if they treat you roughly or you know, your feelings are hurt because they're in high stress and they're just trying to keep themselves and everybody else safe. So just follow directions, do what you're told, provide intelligence if you can, otherwise stay out of the way and do what they tell you. 
Absolutely. And I think that they're so important that uh, the police are there to make sure that they've got the bad guy. They're, they're not there to, to uh, coddle you or to, to, to wrap you in warm blankets and give you a cup of tea just yet. That will come later. Uh, right now, you might be marshaled. You might be, you might be put in uh, isolation until they figure out who's the bad guy and who's not, especially if it's a you know, suspected terror event. It's, uh, there's going to be a process involved after the incident. And uh, don't get your feelings hurt about that. It's more important they do their job than it is that uh, that you feel good about it. Exactly. And when one real quick thing, when you're giving intelligence, try to use something that the police will understand. You can't say he's down by Tom's office. Who the heck is, they don't know who Tom is. So give cardinal directions down at the north end, the south end, the west entrance. You know, let them know things that they can identify with not things that are only known internally yeah or at the very least say the yeah the the uh the collins street entrance or you know what whatever uh, exactly something that they will recognize rather than internal uh you know stuff that they have no clue where mary or john or charlie's office is yeah exactly exactly all right uh, the, the last thing i'd just like to pick your brain about uh, because uh, i deal a lot with uh people within organizations where they may be switched on, they may be, they may see the threat, but they're, they're having a real hard time trying to convince whether it's the, uh, you know, the executive, whether it's the board, whether it's their, you know, whoever controls the purse strings to invest in training or to, to invest in uh, uh, you know, physical protection. Do you have any advice for those people that maybe are trying to get, trying to get their organization to be a little bit more proactive or what they can do to try and um, you know, facilitate that? And that's always a difficult thing because people don't like to think about safety and security until something bad happens. And then when something bad happens, it's a little late and they try to play catch up. Um, one of the things that, you know, people forget that if you go through the training and if you prepare, people feel better. And so it can be, you know, it can give a, a sense of less anxiety and a little more confidence and people think that, wow, you know, administration and the up above, they actually care about us. They're not just putting a Band-Aid on it. They are actually, you know, providing some good training and some good tools and, and taking things seriously to keep people safe and to protect them. And so the goodwill that that can create, and it can also can, uh, lessen turnover and, and some of that is a very positive thing that sometimes people forget. Also finding that if the training is done properly, and what I mean by properly is not that you put a ski mask on the janitor's head and give him a fake gun and tell him to go scare the teachers like was done at a school here in America a couple of years ago. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, that was about the dumbest thing I ever heard of. And luckily that custodian wasn't hurt or killed during the process. Wow. But if, if we give good training that preventing injuries and workman comp, you know, it can reduce the risk and it can mitigate things. And so insurance companies can like that as well. And so those are some avenues that we found that help some of the decision makers and bean counters realize that there can be positive, um, both in morale and in the books for this kind of training and being better prepared. Yeah, that's really good advice. I always, always tell people you, you've got to think about what the, what the language is that the decision maker wants to hear and what they think about and what their priorities are, and then map what you want to their priorities. And and uh, it's, you can't you can't get them to to think like you. You need to think like them. And I think that's super, super important. Exactly, and we, and we also you know if you look in the at the lawsuits that have been done here in America, you know after some of these tragic things. And you could start looking at ways that you can be proactive to prevent those um, from happening if you ever had a, a terrible situation at your um, institution. Yeah. All right, Alan, that, that was a, a tremendous helicopter level uh, view of, of your book, uh, Survivor Shooting Strategies to Survive Active Shooters and Terrorist Attacks. I highly recommend uh, if you are interested in that area that you pick up this book it is the best book on the subject i've read uh and the the reason i think it's it's the best is that it references pretty much 
all the other books that I recommend on this subject. So you've done a, you've done a pretty good job of uh, condensing the other great work on the subject into one volume, which I, I think is uh, is highly valuable. If you're going to buy one book on surviving a shooting, make it this one. That's my recommendation. And uh, as I said, I'll be doing a video review and uh, and unpacking that a little bit further in the near future, hopefully around the same time this episode comes out. So uh, thank you very much for your time in, in answering those questions and giving away some of the trade secrets and, and helping making listeners safer. You know, I appreciate you having me on, Joe. And again, I that's what I want for people. I want people to get out and enjoy life safely and just practice some of the safe habits and have a plan for if something bad goes down and just so they can get through it with the minimal um, you know, effects to them and others. Well, I, I think I think we've achieved that, and uh, and uh, I'm very grateful that people like you are doing this work because it's an important skill set. And as we uh, we enter into a uh, somewhat unprecedented time in modern history, with uh, society being a little bit less stable, people being more scared, more panicked, there's a there's going to be more and more need, unfortunately, uh, for those of us that can help prepare people for that level of uh, uncertainty and volatility. And uh, I'm glad people like you are doing it. Well, thank you. And I, I appreciate that what you're doing, you know, you're helping others too. And, you know, you're doing some awesome interviews. I just feel honored to be among uh, many of the people that you've been interviewing for, you know, a fantastic podcast and stuff that you're doing. Well, thank you very much. All right, Alan, uh, stay tuned for the Magnificent Seven bonus round questions for our Patreon subscribers. But for now, Alan, if people want to know more about you, where can I send them to, uh, to book you or to, to purchase your products or uh, buy a book? The book is available on Amazon, which is the best for if you're outside the United States, because as you mentioned, it's a large book and the shipping actually costs me more to ship than the actual price of the book for those that want autographed copies outside the States. But in the, in the United States, go to surviveashooting.com. And you can also find me at reflexprotect.com where, you know, I'm the director of active defense training there. All right. Perfect. Thank you very much for your time, Alan. Uh, I look forward to talking again in the future. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. I think this has been a hugely beneficial and, uh, and useful episode that's going to have a lot of actionable content for our listeners. So thanks again. Well, thank you. Once again, to Alan Baris for making himself available for the interview. Also for sending me a copy of his book. I have uh, released that video review of the book. I'll put the link to that in uh, in the show notes. It's also available on our YouTube channel and also on our Facebook page if you'd like to check it out there. I uh, highly recommend you pick it up. It's a fantastic book. And as I say in the review, I think it is probably the best book I've ever written. I've ever read, not written, <laughs> the best book I've ever read on uh, on active shooter preparation, uh, but also the history and really a lot of detail about how to create an active shooter survival plan. So I highly recommend you pick that up. Thanks again to Alan. As I said, this is the last episode of the season, but we're only going away for a week. We will be back two weeks from today. Uh, with a brand new episode. I look forward to talking to you soon. Stay safe out there. We'll talk to you again next time. Oh, wow.